Hello. So this video, we're going to be talking about inverse functions. And in particular, we're going to be sort of looking at the potato or cloud diagram version of these things, because we want to sort of understand the relationship of the domain, the codomain, and really the range, and how these things sort of all intermix when we're trying to do inverses of relations in general and functions in particular. Okay, So as a start, inverse functions. So if we have some function, right, from let's say the natural numbers to the natural numbers, right, if you remember your, your F uh, declaration uh, notation here, right, this is the domain and this is the codomain, not the range. The range is within the codomain. So we have some cloud here. It goes to some other cloud here. And the whole point of F is that it takes some value inside your domain and sort of maps it to be some other value in the codomain, right? This is the very general version of what is a function. Now, this is sort of unidirectional, right? I'm going deliberately from the domain to the codomain. These things could be wildly different things, right? Here they're both natural numbers, but we could have like colors and cars or real numbers and integers or all kinds of stuff, right? So it sort of is important that we're going from one to the other specifically, which begs the question, what happens when we try to go backward, right? Like what happens if we start at the output and try to go to the input? Now, this might seem like just a stupid question, like, you know, why would we care? Why not just have another function that sort of does the one to the other and, and not worry about how it's related to the original function. But it turns out this is actually a really natural thing to worry about. For example, if your original function f is, say, the valet parking, right? Like you bring your car in and you get a ticket that represents your car, right? That's the, that's the f part. The domain is sort of the car that you're giving the person to park. And the range bit, the output, the y, is the, the ticket that you get. Well, you probably would want to be able to give your ticket back, right? Giving the Y into the, into the sort of machine, the valet, and get your car back, not some random other car, right? So sort of reversing this process is actually sort of a very important thing to be able to do correctly. Likewise, encryption, right? If you're going to buy something with a credit card, you put in your number and your browser or whatever, the gas pump or the machine at the store, these things encrypt your card and send the data. And it would be sort of really important that when it gets to the other side, it decrypts it back to your card and not some other random card. I mean, that might sound good from a like, yeah, someone else will pay for my stuff until someone else does that and you end up paying for their stuff, right? Like we want this system to work and sort of be this, this thing to be sort of undoable. And that's what that inverse part is doing, okay? All right, so recall, we know that f is a function if every input has one output, right? So that's the, right, you put in a thing and you get a certain thing back. Well, the inverse may not be a function always, right? There are plenty of times where we have some function, but if we try to sort of undo that function, it doesn't sort of work cleanly, right? If we, if we have, uh, for example, x squared and we put in both two and negative two, we get four, but if we try to put in four, we get two or negative two back, right? Like these, these things are sort of problematic. They don't go back as cleanly all the time. Now, if it does work, right, if this is a function when we invert it, the inverse is an actual function, then we say that it is an inverse function. I know, we're not that clever with naming. Uh, but we also denote it with this particular symbol, this f to the minus one, uh, again, to be clear, that minus one happens before the parentheses. So you'd see something like f to the minus one of x or something like that. And we usually actually refer to this as f inverse. So if we saw like f to the minus one of x, we would say f inverse of x. That's how we would actually say it, you know, as a human. Okay. So back to our example here. If we were actually able to undo these things, which again, we sort of would hope would work if we're doing valet parking or encryption. So these things are examples where the inverse is a function. We call that thing f inverse, right, after that minus one. And it is indeed a function, right, because it sort of has to be in order for this system to hold to actually work. You want to get your car back or, you know, nobody else to spend your money. Okay. So in order for a function to have an actual inverse function, which to be clear is what we mean when we say have an inverse, so the assumption is if we say 
f has an inverse, what we mean is it has an inverse function because it will always have an inverse relation. Uh, so unless we're sort of very explicit about relation, we mean function. So if we want f to actually have an inverse function, then that means that each input not only has one output, but that output has to have only the one input, meaning that it has to be unique. That relationship has to be unique. It has to be sort of one to one in both directions. So looking at our sort of example here, if we want the x here, right, if we're, if we're dropping off our car, we have to get a ticket. That ticket also corresponds to that car, right? They are sort of uniquely uh, related between the two, okay? And that's how we know that we have this f inverse where f is domain to codomain, right, end to end, but f inverse is codomain to domain. So although here they're the, sort of the same symbol, the symbols actually flip is, is sort of an important thing. And we'll see sort of a better example of this soon. Okay, so moving forward, sort of classic example of one that sort of works weird is this x squared, right? So if we want to look at f versus some f inverse. I'm putting that in quotes here because this is sort of, at this point, we're hoping it works. If we want f to have an inverse, we have to worry about that uniqueness thing. But as I sort of mentioned a minute ago, this sort of already is going to be a problem because if I plug in 2 and negative 2, I get 4 in both cases, which means it's not unique, right? There's an output that has more than one input that gets there. And that's fine if we're just worried about f being a function. But if we want f to be invertible, meaning if we want f inverse to be a function, that's a problem, right? So this means that f inverse, not a function. Now there's a second part of this. So, so here we can sort of see f being sort of for f of x, x squared, that thing is not invertible as is. We're gonna come back to this, so just keep it in the back of your mind. Let's pretend for a moment that this thing were invertible, okay? So let's say we're looking at f of x squared, uh, or sorry, f of x being x squared, and we want to invert this. How do we figure out what that actual rule is, right? Because we have the declaration. We know that the we have r to r, and f inverse is going to flip those, still r to r. But how do we get the rule part, though? Like, here's the input, here's what you do to get the output. So the general rule of thumb, the sort of general steps to do this, is that we take the f of x, we make it a y, just because people are sort of used to using variables y and x. Um, there's technically speaking no reason we have to do it this way, but it's the easiest way to not make mistakes. <laughs> so the whole idea here, right, is that the inverse flips the role, right? The f takes in an x, gives you a y, f inverse is supposed to take in a y and give you an x, it flips the role that they're doing. So to represent that, what we're gonna do is flip the variables and then sort of resolve for y. So we're gonna flip all the x's to y's and all the y's to x's. In this case, we only have the two. And then we want to sort of resolve for y. So here to isolate y squared into y, I take a square root of both sides. There's some things going on here that we're gonna talk about when we get to radicals where this is sort of not quite right as we're about to see, but we're gonna ignore that for a moment. The important thing here is once I've resolved for y, I can represent that as my declared inverse. I'm saying, okay, this would be the rule, assuming f inverse is a thing, right? By which I mean it's a function. And thus, sort of this is the the rule just like f of x is x squared, now I have f inverse is square root of x. Now, as we saw, there's sort of an issue already. I could take f inverse of four, that's the square root of four, that's two. But remember, before we had negative two also, right? Negative two also gave me that same sort of problem. Right. It gave me four and I'm not seeing it here. So like already there's, a, there's an issue at play. And it's sort of important to note here that like there's nothing in this process that showed me that, right? So it's very easy to sort of solve for the rule and go along your merry way and think you're good when actually you missed a bunch of stuff because you had no way of knowing without checking the original function. The other thing I wanna point out is that f inverse takes the domain and the codomain and flips them, 
which here they're the same thing. But that tells me that f inverse has to work for all of its, of its domain, which is r. That was the codomain before. So if I have to have all of r, that means any number is fair, is fair game. I could plug in any real number here, and I should be able to compute it with f inverse. In particular, if I plugged in negative 4, that should be something I could compute. But negative 4, that's the square root of negative 4. No idea what that is, right? I mean, like, there is a thing that we can do for that. Again, we're going to cover that later for people shouting at their video right now. I know, it is a math thing. But for all intents and purposes, it is not a real number. And that's what we're supposed to get out, right? So it sort of failed in two ways here. One, I have a problem where I only got as output 2 and not negative 2. And I can only have one output if f inverse is going to be a function. So like I can't just be like, oh, well, let's, let's include both. Like That's not an option. And the other problem is that I now have inputs, like negative 4, that don't have any outputs. So I'm not getting all the outputs I need. And I have inputs that don't have outputs. All kinds of problems going on here. So how do we fix this, right? Or can we fix this? So this gets to the sort of heart of one of the major pieces to inverse functions. All this build up to say that there's sort of an underlying thing that goes on with inverting relations to make them inverse functions that is often glossed over. And to see that, let's return back to our spiffy cloud diagram here. So we need that every point with, that, we're, that we're starting with, right? Every x point uh, has a unique sort of version in the y point. And we need that because every point in the codomain of f has to have some input that reaches it, right? This was the problem we had with the negative 4, is if I am allowing all of r over here, that when, then when I sort of flip the roles, right, when I'm taking stuff from the codomain over here and trying to go back to the domain over here, I'm going to end up with stuff that doesn't have an actual thing. Right? So what we need is that the codomain is the range. This is where we need those two things to be the same when sort of by definition they aren't usually the same. Okay? The other thing is we don't really have control over that first part that we were talking about with the like 2 and negative 2 both going to 4. There's nothing we can do about the fact that 2 and negative 2 give you the same thing when you square them. We can't like redefine negative 2 squared to be something else. So there's something going on with the domain here that's a problem, right? So on the one hand, we need the codomain and the range to be the same. At least that's something we have some control over. We could sort of redo the codomain in some sense. But there's a more sort of underlying issue with the domain because there are perfectly valid domain values that we can't deal with and still have the inverse be a function, OK? So again, quick recap, because I know this is sort of a lot of stuff to keep in your head at once. Uh, the two problems, range and codomain have to be the same. That one we can usually get away with by just saying, OK, make them the same, because the codomain is something that we can sort of you know, mess with. It's not a unique thing when we talked about codomains. But that domain issue is the real, that's the real kicker, right, is that we have stuff where we don't have unique sort of values because we have more than one thing in the domain going to the same thing in the range. All right, so how do we deal with that? Well, when we wanted to have the domain and the range be the same, just to be clear, this is the onto or surjective property. And if we have both the function part of it, the sort of injective thing, meaning uh, that we have sort of if we don't have that 2 and negative 2 going to 4 situation, it's hard to describe uh, without just using the terminology, right? If we have that unique relationship, that's, being, that's called being bijective. So the takeaway here, I, I have to go through the steps as a math person, but the takeaway, the thing you really want to take away here is that bijective and invertible are basically the same thing. When you hear one, you want to think of the other, right? So if you hear that a function is invertible, you want to think, ah, it's bijective. If you hear a thing is bijective, you want to think, ah, it's invertible. These are, in some sense, synonymous uh, words. Technically, they mean different things, but the consequences and the underlying meaning are the same. Okay. So we want this bijectiveness, but we don't have the injectiveness. Right? That's the, that's the part that we're missing with that domain bit. So how do we get around that? All right, so here's what, I, here's what we had to do. The answer is we have to sort of 
in order to get this bijection, we need to restrict the domain. So what we mean by that is even though f, like f of x is x squared, this thing can apply to positives, negatives, zero, whatever, we can't use all of the things it works on if we want the inverse to be a function because we need that bijectiveness. So what we do is we carve out a piece of the domain and we say, okay, even though it works on the whole domain, I'm only going to allow it to work on this sub piece. And in fact, the sub piece we're gonna pick in this case is R plus. We're only gonna look at say positive real numbers. So if we do that, right, then that means that our function now has a domain of R plus. And the consequence for that is that our inverse then, if we can get an inverse, suddenly now has a codomain of R plus, because remember those things switch spots. So R plus to R becomes R to R plus, okay? And this is a subtle but important distinction, is that by restricting to R plus, it has the consequence of restricting the range. So I can't restrict the range sort of artificially directly. What I have to do is restrict the domain so that I get a range that I want, okay? So by restricting to R plus, I have at least sort of in principle, restricted what I might be able to get as an output. So for example, if I'm only using R plus, I'm only using strictly positive numbers, zero is no longer in the domain. And that means that I don't have zero in the range anymore because if I don't have zero as input, nothing squared is gonna be zero on the output. So I've sort of restricted my domain as a consequence of this. Importantly, I've restricted my codomain to R plus, strictly positive uh, numbers, or I should say I've, I've restricted my range to this thing, and since I want my codomain and range to become equal, I can restrict my codomain to that. But the thing is, is once I've done that, now I'm good, because if we think about what happened, right, this forward thing still works, right, I can still plug in five and square it, and I'm, I'm good to go. But importantly, if I want to go backward, if I want to say, pick out four, right, because I'm restricting to R plus, so I pick a positive num number four, and go back, now I'm only going from positive things here so that when I go back and I land at positive two, I actually am getting the right value. I don't have to worry about negative two because I've restricted my domain in the first place to get rid of it. And so my input then, I don't have to worry about possible negatives here, and I don't have to worry about having sort of more than one input. So restrict the domain, to get R plus, that restricts my codomain, or more accurately, my range, which then I make my codomain the same as, that also becomes R plus. Thus, my function becomes R plus to R plus, which means my inverse becomes R plus to R plus, which means everything works. <laughs> All right, so I realize this is like a lot of stuff to keep track of, but let's maybe wrap this up in a way to sort of hit the high parts. In order to have an inverse function, Right? We need that the inverse process sort of works as a function, meaning that I take one thing in and I get exactly one thing out. So I have to have everything that I can put in. Right? When, I, when I take the inverse relation, I'm switching the role of domain and codomain, and that means that everything that I'm putting in has to have a value. That's why we shrink the codomain down to the range. And I need that it has only one value going back. And a lot of the times that's not something that we can guarantee. So the way we get around that is we restrict the actual original domain of the original function in such a way that going back only hits those pieces that now are allowed, okay? So succinctly put, flip the domain and codomain for our, our uh, relation, right, in order to get a function. And then sometimes we have to restrict the domain of the original function in order to make sure that it actually is a function when we do that. And just like we flip the domain and codomain, we flip the x and the y and resolve in order to get the appropriate rule. Okay? So that is that.